Hey folks, it's Chris again. And in this video, I want to go through and kind of help you out with your first threat hunt using Rita. I'm going to assume you've gone through the other steps uh, in the other videos I've done. You've got it installed. You're either grabbing uh, traffic live off the wire or you're reading PCAPs. Uh, how you're going to process them is going to be very similar. There's a couple of minor differences between the two, but we'll cover those as we go through. But once we've got data, we do read a space, view space, whatever the name of that data set is, and we end up at a screen kind of similar to this one. So if you've used Reader in the past, you can see this is very different. It used to generate a CSV output, and now it's a nice graphical interface. I've got a severity level over here. So in the past, we've always used a score. Uh, problem with the score is it's kind of subjective, right? What that number actually means. Critical, high, medium, low, people understand what that means. So that, that makes it a little bit more straightforward. It's identifying where was the traffic scene originating from, and it's always going to be from the internal network out towards the internet, because that's what we check out. Where was it going? Were there any beacon characteristics to it? And if so, how certain are we that there's persistency in this beacon-like connection? So when we say 100%, we're dead certain, yeah, this is definitely a beacon. If we're saying zero, yeah, no, it really does not look like a beacon. We also identify the duration of how long these systems have been communicating with each other. Uh, keep in mind, this can be larger than what time span you might be looking at. So for example, if I read in a 24-hour PCAP, it is possible that I could record more than 24 hours and the reason for that is there may be multiple connections running simultaneously between those two systems, and we're going to go through and add all of those together. If it looks like C2 over DNS, we're going to identify the number of subdomains we see associated with that domain. And if this is an item that lands on one of your thread intel lists, we'll go through and indicate it over here. So this gives us a nice summary of what's taking place over on the network. I can use my arrow key to switch back and forth between different line entries. And as I do, you'll see the data over on the right-hand side changes. My data on the right is greater details about what you're looking at in the, uh, with this connection pair. So for example, up at the top here, it's just repeating. Here's my source and destination IP address. This is new to Rita, prevalence. Prevalence identifies what portion of your network has been talking to this target out on the internet. So now in this case here, it's a one of one, meaning that we're only looking at data from one system. So it's not very helpful to us here. And quite honestly, anytime we process a PCAP, prevalence may not be overly helpful. And the reason for that is a lot of times PCAPs get generated and we limit them to certain things. We might limit you know, the source address to only one system like we did here. It might be limited to just one of our internal subnets, uh, one or multiple external targets. Again, prevalence with PCAPs, not that helpful, but if I'm doing a live capture and I'm watching all the traffic from my network leaving, that's where prevalence really shines. You know, imagine I've got 100 systems on my network and prevalence says 90 of my 100 systems have been talking to this target IP address. Um, an overwhelming majority of my network is compromised or this is probably gonna turn out to be something I don't need to worry about. I could probably go through, filter it out, and uh, you know, create a safe list for it later type of thing. It, it's designed to kind of help guide you that way. You know, If a majority of your network is, is talking to it and you feel like your network is mostly safe, you're probably gonna be okay. First scene identifies when was the first time any of the internal, uh, the, that any host on the internal network was seen talking to this target. And again, not as useful with PCAPs because it only goes within the scale of the PCAP itself. So for example, uh, in this particular PCAP, I have 24 hours worth of data and it, we started seeing it you know, about an hour into the PCAP. Well, okay, you know, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot because I've only got a 24 hour scale that I'm working with anyway. But again, if I'm doing live monitoring, that's really where it's going to shine because I may see an entry up here that says you first started talking to that host 90 days ago or, or more than 90 days ago. 90 is the maximum. So we'll count up the days up till 90. And then after that, we'll just say, you know, 90 plus, which means it's been more than 90 days. Well, I've been talking to that host for 90 days and I haven't detected anything malicious with that system. It's probably okay. Also, systems that I've been talking to for a long period of time are less likely to be hostile. Doesn't mean, you know, this is not an absolute, but they're less likely to be hostile than let's say something that just showed up an hour ago or four hours ago. 
you know, the new stuff tends to be more interesting. I want to go in and pay more attention to that. So that's what these metrics are for here. Notice this line entry here, MIME type ma uh, mismatch. When that pops up, that's telling me, because it doesn't pop up all the time. If I go to the one below it, notice it doesn't have that. What MIME type mismatch is telling me is that the client downloaded a file from the server where the file extension and the server MIME type didn't jive with each other. I'll give you a couple of examples. So imagine I, the, my URI downloaded a JPEG image, right? Well, the MIME type for that should be image slash JPEG. Well, what if the server says handle that like a text file? Well, that's weird. <laughs> it shouldn't be doing that. That happens a lot in command and control channels. You know, they do that to kind of obfuscate what they're doing but it shouldn't be happening normally. So if you see that, yeah, that tends to score an all, a lot of points that this is something that you need to go and pay attention to. Uh, another possibility might be, you know, the URI points to a PHP file. And again, it's indicating no process this like a text file. You know, and again, that's an, that's, those are pretty common tech techniques used within command and control channels. So those would be worth going in and paying attention to. Rare signature, we look at the user agent strengths and the J3 hashes that are being used to communicate with hosts out on the internet. And if this is associated with something that's unique for that system, we go through and flag that. So for example, this 10.0.2.15 system may normally use a user agent string that's associated with Windows 10. And it uses that, you know, when it talks to, you know, dozens of different IPs address uh, out on the internet. But just when it talks to this host here, it's using this string here. Internet Explorer 7? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> right? I don't think so. This is definitely an outdated, you know, Windows NT 5.2. I think that's Windows 2000 or something like that. Yeah, no, no. We, we hopefully don't have that running on our environment. Rare signature helps me to identify, hey, the system's identifying itself differently than it normally does, because that's another potential indicator of a command and control channel. So that's worth going in and paying attention to. And then down the bottom, I just get some metric summaries. So I see how many connections took place, how much data was moved back and forth, and what was the communication to. It was to TCP port 80, and Zeke detected an HTTP header within the application string. If it, it, this does, you know, one of the nice things about Zeke and you know, processing data through Zeke is Zeke won't call it HTTP just because it went to TCP 80. It's got to actually see the application header. Uh, it's application aware for about 55 different applications. So I know this was, in fact, definitely an HTTP session. Cool, that's that first one. I get out of the second one. This also is looking like a beacon. About an hour and a half of total communications take place. Even less data was sent, only 260 kilobytes, so that's not much. 48 connections took place. So that's the last. So it's doing this probably about every half hour or so because the beacon score is pretty high. So I'd say it's pretty close to exactly every half hour that it's going through and communicating back. Uh, 101, 23 hours ago, again, it's because it's in a PCAP, so that's not overly helpful to me. We are getting a rare signature identifier here. So this may be the only system that signature is being used with. That may make this interesting and worth kind of running down. Now, a little bit of a limitation with the tool. Notice in destination, it's identifying the destination as tile-service.weather.micro. We only have so much space to be able to go through and print this out. So we've got two options from here. One is go back to the Zeek logs and see what that is. You know, I'm pretty certain that's going to end up being Microsoft.com. The other thing you can do is you can run read a view with the dash dash STD out switch, and that'll print it out in CSV format, and in CSV format, we'll print out the entire line. So you will see some truncation just because of space limitations. We're working to try to extend this out as much as we possibly can. But just kind of a heads up on that. Also, notice we've got a fully qualified domain name here. Back on that first item, it was listed as an IP address. Anything that's HTTP or HTTPS, you should see a fully qualified domain name here. For HTTP, we look at the host parameter. For HTTPS, we look at the SNI parameter, and we identify what was the fully qualified domain name of the system you were trying to go to accordingly. This tells me it was a direct IP connection. So that makes this top one even more suspicious, which is why that's being identified as being critical. Uh, let's see, we've got another one here, right? This is an SSL session. We're seeing 
an IP address, not a fully qualified domain name. So that makes that a little bit suspicious. That may be worth taking a deeper dive on. The connection was running for you know almost 19 hours. Now, this says 19 hours. This says 18. What, what's, what's the difference? What's going on? On the right-hand side of the screen, we're just printing whole numbers. So anything that's a fraction ends up just getting truncated off. So if you see something says there were zero bytes transmitted. Well, all that means is that it was less than a byte. You know, if I see 18 hours, well, that could be 18 hours. That could be 18 hours and 59 minutes. Anything in that range is going to get truncated to 18. Just a heads up so you know. But you can see here, yeah, we got 19 hours worth of connections. That may make them uh, worth running down. Now, let's say there's something that I want to investigate, but I don't see it show up on the screen. Well, a new function we have is the search function. So I can go up and I can hit the backslash key. And now I can tell it what I want to go in and search for. And I can use these column titles to identify what that is. And if I'm not sure what to use, I can hit the question mark and that'll pull up my online help. So for example, this one, uh, this multiple one here, this is saying, hey, if the source is 192.168.88.2, and the destination is this, and the beacon score is greater than 90, I want you to flag that. And if there's multiple entries, I want you to sort it based on the duration. So I can go through and I can search for particular items. I, have, I can play around with the uh, sort options here. If I wanted to go in and sort these based on source IP, just to see what each system is doing in order, I could go through and I could do that. So it gives us a lot of capability to be able to go through and you know, really kind of hone in on what it is I want to pay attention to. So that is Reader in a Nutshell. So hopefully this helps you get up, get up to speed and get started. If you have additional questions, there's a Reader channel on the Threat Hunting Discord server. Please feel free to jump in there and ask questions. Catch you all on the flip side.